Praise the Lord. More that is so good and so true. He deserves all of our praise and even more than we could possibly ever get. You guys can be seated if you'd like to. I mean, I, you can stand up while I preach. It'll be fine. That's okay. <laughs> Might get a little tired, though. I have a tendency to be a little long at times. But anyway, anyway, uh, I tell you, I'm really excited. And I said this last week. And in, um, at the risk of being a mockingbird, um, I, uh, I'm really excited about this series. Because it's something that I've never preached before, for one thing. And then secondly, secondly, I believe there's so much truth there that can be helpful to people. Because one of the things that I feel in all of my years, 42, three years in the ministry, and witnessing to people and trying to win them to faith in the Lord and uh, trying to influence lives for Christ and, and so forth, one of the things that I picked up on many times was just a basic lack of enthusiasm about heaven. Now, I know we're all going to be happy to go there. And if I ask you, you would say, man, I, whoo, heaven's going to be wonderful. And I said, well, what is it going to be like? And you would go, uh, well, God will be there. <laughs> I'll be there. You know, won't be any sickness and sorrow. And, you know, you'll know a few descriptions like that. But what, will that, what does that really mean? I mean, what, what will it be like to live in heaven? What will it be like? What will we be like? What will our bodies be like? I talked to you that, about that last week and, and tried to assure you that your body's going to be indescribable. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be supernatural and supranatural. It's going to be better than any superhero that you've ever <laughs> looked at and been excited about. Uh, when Jesus comes back, he's going to redeem our bodies, and they're going to be different, and they're going to be wonderful, and they're going to be able to do all kinds of things and experience all kinds of things. And I, I just have picked up over the years in just a general uh, kind of a flat feeling about heaven as if it's going to be boring. You know, we're going to float around on a cloud and strum on a harp and, you know, we're going to go and worship God and praise God, which I'm not being negative about that and neither would anybody else, I don't think, but it's almost like, you know, how long can you do that and not get bored with it, you know, or, you know, eternity's eternity. I mean, eternity's forever. There is no end to eternity. A million years means nothing in eternity. Absolutely nothing. And so what's it going to be like? What, can, can, can we get a little enthusiasm about uh, what Christ is going to do on the day that he comes back, or night, and snatches us away? Is there anything to be really fired up about? Is that going to be, you know, I, I've had young people think, well, you know, Pastor, I understand what you're saying about heaven, but I mean, it, do you think it's going to be really soon? And they kind of say that with a little bit of a disappointment in their voice. Like, man, I want to live my life. You know, I, I, I'm young and I, I want to get married. I want to have children. I want to live a life. I want to, you know, and they're, and they're just being honest about it. I'm not mocking that. Just being honest, like, uh, like somehow when, when we go to heaven, it, all of our pleasure, all of our enjoyment, all of our adventure, everything ends. But it, what I'm trying to promote is the fact that it's just the opposite of that. That if you're, if you're thinking about living here and you get excited about that, you're getting excited about living in the torture chamber. This is the torture chamber. This is where everything's bad. I mean, this is, the, this is the ultimate lowest mark of your existence is living here. The greatest day ever is going to be when Jesus come and get me and takes me back to everything God planned for humanity to be and to have and to enjoy before Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. Because that's what redemption is. You know, we, we say, let me just read the passage. This is the kind of one I'll read every time because it just, it just says what I want us to spark off of. This is out of Luke 21, and it begins at verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, 
and on the earth, distress of nations, uh, check that, with perplexity, check that, and the seas and the waves, disturb nations, when, we, when, we're, when you're reading about prophecy, that's what that means, it's not actual like oceans and stuff, like the Green New Deal and stuff like that, it, it's not, I mean, I guess it could be, but, but in every other prophecy area, when it talks about seas and oceans, it's talking about groups of people, like, like giant nations of people. They're all distressed. They're all messed up. They're all out of whack. Okay, check that box. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Jesus is talking about terrorism, phobos, fear, uh, in the last days. Uh, check that box. And for those things that are coming on the earth. Uh, what, not only what's happening now, but what it's gonna bring. What, what bigger ills is it gonna bring? Yeah, okay, well we got that. Uh, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Now I've never spoken to you about this phrase. This phrase is, is, is a tremendous phrase and it's used in several places in prophecy and sometimes it's used, and the heavens and the earth will be shaken. Now, what that means is, it means that the foundations that we put our trust in are going to be shaken. In other words, all of us have trust in something as being secure, being safe, being uh, provisional in our life. It might be a belief system. It might be uh, money. It might be your family name. It might be property. I mean, you, you, you feel safe and secure and, and, and you're calm somewhat because of something. Well, that's the foundation of your life. And what this is saying is that those foundations that you've always put your trust in are going to be shaken like this country, like patriotism, like being an American. All of that's going to be shaken. Whew, you, can, you can check that box. Then, verse 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's our word rapturo, which means to snatch away. We get our word rapture from that. Verse 28, now, when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, because your redemption draws near. So Jesus is saying, when these things begin to happen, it's not going to take very long. As soon as they begin to happen, you start looking up. Don't, don't, don't look down, don't look at the earth, don't look at the people, don't look at the evil, don't look at any, don't take your eyes off of me. Keep your head lifted up, keep your eyes looking for me because your redemption is right around the corner. And by redemption, he means to something that has been bought back. If I never owned a, an item, I could never redeem it because I never owned it to start with. Therefore, I can't buy it back. I can buy it for the first time, but I can't buy it back. So it's not redemption. Redemption means to buy back, to purchase again. And what this is talking about is, when God created Adam and Eve in the garden, he created them with everything. The garden was paradise. Eden means delight, by the way. That's what the name means. God created, and you know, I titled today's message, Welcome to Pleasureville. God created mankind in Pleasureville with every pleasure that you can possibly imagine right there for the enjoyment, the full enjoyment of a fully created body that was designed to enjoy pleasure out of your mind. I mean, you think you experience pleasure now? And think about any pleasure that you experience. Anything that brings you pleasure. Anything that thrills your heart, that tickles your soul, that causes you to be happy and giggly and bubbly and joyful. God, you have never experienced pleasure in this torture chamber like you are going to experience when God gives you back your redeemed pleasure. You see, when Adam and Eve lost it, they lost it for all of us. Since by one man, Adam, came death, 
By one man, Jesus, came the resurrection. So Adam lost it all, and we lost it all. We have been born into sin. We have polluted blood. We got it from our father who got it from his father who got it from his father who got it from his father. And then somebody got it from Adam and Eve. And we all came from there. We have polluted blood. We were born in sin. We were born of sin. We, were, we, we practice sin. We live in sin. We battle sin. We're in a fallen state. Now we have the Holy Spirit inside of us if we're Christians. So we have a portion. And I say that word, and, and, I, and I want you to understand, the Holy Spirit is everything. Don't get me wrong. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of God. Full God. But because of the fallenness of our bodies and our souls and our spirits and our lives, we cannot handle the full redemption of everything the Holy Spirit can bring into our life. So the scripture calls it, the old King James word is, we have a foretaste. You know, it, sample this. Ooh, yeah, that's great. Give me a little. No, can't handle it. We have a foretaste of what we're going to have. So imagine now everything you've experienced from God. Imagine how your heart almost explodes at times when you worship him because whatever you're saying to him is just right on track and it's just going right and you can almost see God receiving it, you know, and you're hearing him and he's talking back. Think about the times that you've prayed and you've sensed that the presence of God was right there with you, all around you. Think about the times that you, you would almost... Uh, you know, you would almost pledge that you heard the voice of God, that it actually, you heard what he said because his presence was so real. And it, that's a foretaste. That doesn't even register on the scale of what we will experience one day in heaven as we receive our redeemed stuff. <laughs> and I've got five things. I, I don't know, I might get some more by, by the time we get there, but I got five of them that I think are really true and real and, and very seeable in the Word of God. And, and, and so today we're going to look at, at our redeemed pleasure. And let me just hasten to say that one of the big, big signs of the times is you see it every day. It, it, turn on any channel especially the ones that aren't fake. Turn on any channel and watch what's happening. And watch the lawlessness that's going on. One of the gigantic societies, by the way, that the word, Greek word for lawlessness is anomia, which means rebelling against God. That's what that word lawlessness means, to rebel against God. And I mean, things, that, we're in free fall. <laughs> Seriously. We're, we're just in free fall. Every moral issue, every, every care, caring issue, loving issue, respect issue, uh, uh, knowledgeable, every one of the, it's just free fall. And we're, and we're out of control. And, it, and, it's, and, it, and the, the ones that commit illegalities are lauded and cheered and, and yes, they're, and the ones that do right are punished and restricted and, 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 and uh, pushed down. That's lawlessness, guys. And that is one of the major signs of the end times. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this in 2 Thessalonians 2, and let no one deceive you by any means. Paul's talking to, Tim, uh, to the Thessalonians, excuse me, I think I said Jesus. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, notice it's capitalized, so it's talking about a specific day, the rapture is the day that it's talking about. 
For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. By the way, <clears throat> that is the word for apostasy, which means to depart from the truth. So Paul's saying, look, you need to know this, that this great day of snatching away is not going to come before a great falling away from the truth starts happening all over this land and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. We are already experiencing, you know, the Bible talks about antichrist a lot. I, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. If you read the Bible casually, you probably aren't aware that the word antichrist is used quite often in the scripture des, de, uh, describing a spirit, the spirit of antichrist. There is a real antichrist, a person, a, an entity that is going to be the antichrist in the last seven years of human history on this earth called the tribulation. But the spirit of antichrist is already at work. That's what the scripture says. Because the, the antichrist is the devil and the spirit of antichrist is his, is his uh, inspiration, his... Uh, his desire, his movement in life. We have lots of antichrists in this world today because anyone that is being led by a spirit that is not of Christ has the spirit of antichrist in them. And Jesus said it's going to get worse and worse and Paul said, hey, you need to know it's not going to happen until, until there's a falling away first. And this is what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy. Look at this real quick. I'll, I'll make this real quick. But know this, now this is Paul talking to his young preacher boy. This is, the, he, he, Timothy's like a young mentor for Paul. And, and Paul sends it, Paul goes and starts a church somewhere, wins a bunch of souls, starts a church, calls for Timothy to come be the pastor. Timothy's his man. So he's telling Timothy, here's what he's telling him in 2 Timothy 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Harsh times, fierce times, savage times is what, what he's talking about. For men will be lovers of themselves. Have you ever seen a time where people love themselves more than they do now? Do you watch them talk? Do you listen to them talk? Man, it couldn't be me. I'm the greatest in the world. I've never made a mistake in my life. It's got to be somebody else. I'm, just see these things. Boasters. I'll, I'll go by. Proud. <laughs> Blasphemers. Disobedience to parents. How did, that, how did that get in that list? That looks, so, that looks so marginal, doesn't it? I mean, you got lists where you got lovers of, of sin, you got unthankful, unholy, you got, and then you got, uh, 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 they don't obey their parents. It looks like, that, that's a misplaced, isn't it? No. no, it's talking about, look, there are people that don't even do the basic, the basic control of their life. Obedience to your parents is the basic obedience of life. It is the first authority in your life. And if you don't even obey the first authority in your life, you're certainly not going to obey any other authority in your life. You are a rebel and you are rebelling against authority, which is against God, because authority comes from God. There you are in the list. Unholy, unloving, Astorgos is what that word is. That means the old King James little phrase, if you read the original King, this is new King James Version. If you read the original King James Version, it says, without natural affection. That means you don't even love your family. Not only do you not love anybody else, not only do you not have affection for people that you should have affection for and sympathy and compassion on people like old people and sick people and, 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 and infants in a womb and stuff like that, but you don't even love your own family. Man, children are killing their parents and parents killing their children. 40 years ago, we didn't hear about stuff like that. We didn't see, it's just rampant nowadays. We don't even blink when we hear it anymore. It's so commonplace. Unforgiving. I'm gonna tell you, this cancel culture that we're in today is unforgiving. 
And by that, I mean you just you do something 25 years ago that might have been okay 25 years ago, but it ain't okay now. And you represent the wrong party, person, belief system, or whatever, and you will be canceled, and you will be killed and destroyed if they possibly can. And I don't care what you do, I don't care what you've done over the past 25 years, your sin back then will never be forgiven. You could have done every imaginable thing to reconcile that, to work through that, to show that you didn't believe that. That was a, something back then. And it doesn't matter. You're going to be irreconcilable is what that means. Unforgiving. You're not going to be able to get mercy, forgiveness, or any other element like that. Does that is, this a, is this a list of what we're watching every day? Slanderers. Slander. Oh, I, I could just go, but I'm not. Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, just because it's good. I hate it. I despise it. it. Just because it's good. No other reason. Traitors. Gosh, we're our nation full of traitors today. They need to be under the jail somewhere. Traitors. Just pure Traitors. They call them all kinds of things, but they're traitors is what they are. Headstrong, haughty. They're traitors and don't even care if you know it. Just haughty. Can't do anything to me. These are spirits of the last days, guys. This is what I'm saying to you. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Claiming to be Christians, but won't believe God for anything. Claiming that God is the one who gives us our resources. And working behind the scenes to get money, 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 money. It's all about money. Going out in front of the people and pretending that things are about God and this is about faith and this is about world evangelism and this is about all of that and all the time just hoarding in millions and millions and millions so you can fly your $50 million jet somewhere. Having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. What does he say to us? And from such people turn away. That's good advice, by the way. 19 descriptions given by the Apostle Paul of what people are going to be in the last day, and you can put a check mark right beside every one of them. So Jesus says, when you see these things begin to happen, it's going to be quick. Lift up your eyes, lift up your head. Don't get wrapped up in that. That's the way it's going to be. Just keep your eyes up for Jesus because he said, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way. And the reason that many people don't get excited, I think, is because they don't really, they don't know what's going to happen when Jesus comes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Let's look at redeemed pleasure. I'm, I could last all day on that kind of stuff. All right. This is another thing we get back. We get new bodies and we get redeemed pleasure. Uh, Adam and Eve, I've mentioned to you, were created in delight, were created in Pleasureville. Uh, God intended, God never intended for human beings to experience pain or suffering. God is the greatest parent in all of creation. And you as parents, let me ask you a question. If you had a choice between your child suffering pain and you feeling pain instead, which would you choose? I would, I would venture to say that you parents that are sitting in here right now, if you had a choice between your child experiencing pain or you experiencing pain for that child so that that child would not have to suffer, I would say that you would choose to feel the pain so that your child could not, would not have to suffer. When Adam and Eve rebelled, it ushered pain into this earth. God never intended it to have pain. 
Pain is something that happened when we fell. You want to you see it? Look, Genesis 3. Here it is right here. Verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. This is talking about hardship and toil. When you conceive, you are going to start having hardship. Your carriage of the baby is going to produce pain. You're going to get sick every day. You're going to have back pain. You're going to have um, uh, issues that cause you to toil in your body and strain in your body all the way through your conception, all the way through your pregnancy. In pain, you shall bring forth children. It's going to be really painful when you have them. You're going to have labor pains and contractions and you're going to have all systems of your bodies. You're going to, it's going to be the closest you come to death without dying when you have this child. Your desire shall be toward your husband and he shall rule over you. Now let me tell you what that means. I know many people think, oh, well, I'm going to want to please him, but he's going to use it against me. That's kind of what you're thinking, maybe. That means. It's a pretty good understanding of it, but it really means a little bit more than that. Your desire, ladies, given at the fall, means that you are going to have a desire, and your husband is going to have a desire. And your desire is going to be toward your husband. In other words, your desire and his desire are going to butt up against each other. There's going to be a competition for who's in control is what it's really boiling down to. God did not create man and woman to have differences. God intended for men and women to have a, uh, an interdependent relationship with each other so that no one is in control of the relationship. They make decisions together. They think together. They do things together. They're interdependent upon each other. But when the fall comes, what happens is women lose their ability to lord over relationships, but they're always going to be fighting to do that. And men are going to be fighting against women. To, and, and, you're, and remember, this is a curse now. This is a curse of the way things were intended to be. And he says, let, let, me, just, let me give you a quote out of the New Living Translation. It, it just makes it a little bit easier. You will desire, this is that verse in the New Living Translation. You will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. So, you're going to want to dominate your husband and he's going to dominate you and both of you are going to constantly battle for control in this relationship. That's what happened in the fall. God never intended it that way. Verse 17, Then he said to Adam, Because you heeded the voice of your wife and you've eaten from the tree of which I've commanded you, saying, You shall not eat, cursed is the ground for your sake. So the earth gets cursed. It didn't even ask for it. It didn't do a thing. But it got it. I'm sure the earth's going, wait, what? I didn't, I didn't do anything. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. You're going to have to work hard all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you will return. So pain came into the human race on the day that Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And we can't even measure the pain that humanity has suffered since we lost it in the garden. I, I, I put, put up the next slide. I think I put it on it. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, 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 so you could see them because when I say 
Pain, you're going, oh yeah, it's pain. You know, I know, you're talking about pain. Yeah. Uh, well, this is what I'm talking about. Look here, emotional pain. Some of them I just listed. Rejection, loss, failure, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, divorce. Never intended. Never intended. That's painful. God, that's, we got that when we fail. Uh, physical pain, illness, accidents, violence, death. That all happened when we fail. Mental pain, confusion, deception, abuse, lies, ignorance, poverty, spiritual attacks, mental illness, dysfunction, rebellion, rejection, unmet needs, dominance, all of that. Pain. And all of that pain entered our lives because of the fall. We were ushered into the human race because Adam and Eve rebelled against God. But here's the good news. The good news is that on the day that Jesus breaks through those clouds and takes us off of this earth, we will have no more pain. None of that stuff will ever be a part of our life anymore. And we get all of our pleasure back. Let me show you Revelation 21. Verse, first verse, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Look at this. Also, there was no more sea, John said. I, I, point of personal privilege, I think John was smiling when he wrote that. Because John, the apostle John, the disciple John, was, a, was about 90 years old when he wrote that. He lived to be about 100 years old, by the way. And, and, and the last year and a half before he wrote this, for the last year and a half, he had been on an island out in the middle of the ocean. And I'm sure that all he saw every day was the sea. On, he looked that way, sea, sea, east, where, and where he looked, look, look, no land, sea. He looked, island, small, Patmos, small little uh, island that was used to punish people, to, to put prisoners on. That's, that's all it was. And they put him out there on that, on, that, on that prison island. And that's where God spoke to him and gave him the book of Revelation. That's where God spoke to him. So for a year and a half, a 90-year-old man sitting out on a rock, seeing nothing but ocean all the way around him. And when, when, he, when God showed him the new heaven and the new earth, and it didn't have any ocean there, he said, and there was no more sea. Thank God for that, you know. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And look at verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And everything's become new. Look, we don't just lose pain when we get to heaven. We inherit unmeasurable pleasure. Look, I put this verse up last week and maybe didn't get cited, but look at this verse. From David out of Psalm 16. He says, you, <laughs> you will show me the path of life in your presence. Where? In your presence. Where? In your presence. What am I going to get? Fullness of joy. At your right hand. Where? At your right hand. Where? where? In heaven at your, at your right hand. Are pleasures forevermore. So we're not going to just, <laughs> we're not going to just lose pain. We're going to, we're going to gain pleasure that God intended for us to have in the, since the Garden of Eden. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul says you can't even imagine what it is. You're sitting here, I know you're sitting here, you're thinking, you're imagining 
You can't even, you can't even begin to imagine the Apostle Paul says. God, not, he goes on in 2 Corinthians 12, look at what he says. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast, this is Paul talking, giving his testimony, I'll come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Okay, so God show me visions and, and uh, revelations, but uh, it's not profitable for me to boast about that. Okay, because I know a man in Christ, and I read this to you, this little portion last week. I know a man who in Christ, who 14 years ago, whether he was in the body, or I don't know, or whether he was out of the body, I don't know. Paul said, I don't know if I was just a spirit or if it my whole body up there. I, I don't know, God knows. Such a one was called up, there's our word harpazo, our word rapture, snatched up, I was snatched up to the third heaven above the, above the air that we breathe, above the cosmos and the planets up there, up into the third heaven. I was taken up into the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but God knows how he was caught up into paradise. That's a fitting description of it. Paul said, it, it was paradise. That's all I can say. That's the word I can use. And heard inexpressible words which are not lawful for a man to utter. It, the apostle Paul got up there and he said, I began to hear stuff and I can't even translate. Look, the stuff I heard can't even be translated into a language that the earth can understand. It is it's so unbelievable, it's inexpressible. And the things that I saw, I can't talk about Eden. You know, heaven is paradise. The Garden of Eden is paradise. And we're going back to paradise with Jesus. When Jesus comes in a cloud, we're going back to paradise with Jesus. There are five things that have to be true in order for a place to be called paradise. If any one of these is not true, it's not paradise. So we have five elements here. Now, I mean, I know you're getting your pencils out, but I'm only going to say about a sentence about each one, so I think you'll remember it. You can write the names down in there if you want to. These five characteristics of paradise. So this is what heaven's going to be like when we get there. The first characteristic is beauty. In order for a place to be a paradise, it has to be beautiful, beyond description. Now, you can't look at some ugly place Broken down wall fences, trailer parks, uh, raggedy ditches, uh, torn up roads. Uh, not any paradise. No, no, no. You can't call an ugly place paradise. Paradise is a beautiful place. Second thing that must be true uh, is uh, comfort. If it's going to be paradise, it has to be comfortable. It has to have all of the amenities. I might have to let Justin or Tanya, somebody like that. Some of you other guys are so good at seeing amenities. You look at it and go, well, it needs, well, no. Well, wait, we need, uh, well, uh, well, it doesn't have, uh, yeah. <laughs> All the comfort that you can imagine. Everything is perfect. Everything's in its place. You can't even think about something that you would want to make you comfortable that it's not there. Paradise. Here's the third thing that every paradise must have, pleasure. Pleasure. If it's a paradise, it has to accommodate all of your senses. It has to look good, it has to smell good, it has to feel good, it has to taste good, and it has to sound good. And if heaven doesn't have all of that, then it ain't heaven. That's a paradise. The fourth thing about a paradise is it has to have plenty. They, there, there can't be any need there. There can't be any want there. I, there can't be a shortage of something there and it be a paradise. No, no, no. And then the last thing, and this one I think would be obvious, is safety. It has to be safe. You can't, you can't be in a paradise if you feel like you're going to be attacked or somebody's going to walk up and shoot you. That's not paradise. That's the other place, all right? Yeah, so Jesus has taken us back to paradise, a beautiful place, a comfortable place, a pleasurable place, plenty, place of plenty, safe place. There are so many places on earth that can qualify as a paradise, based on those descriptions, right? You want to go to some of them, huh? Like, there are places in the mountains that are beautiful like this and just, ooh, amenities. There are places on the beaches, there are islands, there are places all over the world 
that qualify as a paradise. And they would be paradise, but there's one difference between earthly paradise and heavenly paradise. Earthly paradise always has a downside. Has a downside. Heavenly paradise, there's no downside. Let me just show you. On earth, if you eat too much, you get fat, right? You lose your health, but not in heaven. Let me read Revelation 22, all right? This is the last chapter of Revelation, and it's describing the New Jerusalem, where we're going to be living and where our mansions are actually being built at this time. This is where we're going to be living. And I'm just going to read one, one verse, verse 2, all right? It has just described the river of life that's flowing right down the middle of the street. All right. Verse 2, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river, the river of life, was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits. You ask, Pastor, what kind of fruit? So I thought I would just mention a few varieties of fruit that will be growing on the tree of life. Bacon, peanuts, <laughs> corn, fried chicken, and crab legs, Bill. <laughs> and to top it all off, the river of life is gonna be flowing with banana pudding. I mean, after all, this is heaven, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, and so the, it, it's, de it's described as a wonderful place of paradise with all of these, and, and each tree yielding its fruit every month. It's just going to replenish itself. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. All right. On earth, if you, eat, if you rest too much, what happens to you? You get lazy. That's the downside. If you stay in the sun too long on earth, what happens to you? You get burned up like a lizard. You get sunburned, right? If you spend too much money on earth, you go broke, but not in heaven because there's no downside to heaven. You can do whatever you want for as long as you want, and there is no downside in heaven. Now, with that in mind, I want to finish up by asking you to dream with me for a second, all right? And I had to write this down, and I'm going to read it because I would never get through it if I just tried to tell you. It'd be a hundred years long. But I want you to dream with me for a minute. Now, let me say this to you. You know, I always tell you when I'm, when I'm giving you my opinion about things. When I'm, when I'm in the Scripture and when I'm reading the Word, um, I'm not saying I can't be wrong. I'm human, and I can be wrong. But I feel very confident that I'm right when I'm in the Scripture and, 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 and interpreting the Scripture. Now, my opinion, on the other hand, is just my sanctified opinion. And by that, I mean I've been with the Lord for 45 years, something like a long time, 47 years. Been preaching, study my head off all the time. And I have an opinion based on that, based on that, um, that about heaven. And, and, and I'm, so I'm going to read this to you. I wrote it. I'm going to read it to you because... I'm not trying to teach you anything about the Bible. So when I read this, don't be thinking he's, he's telling me about some verse or something. No I'm, not, no, I'm not trying to teach you anything about the Bible by what I'm reading. What I am trying to do is I'm trying to encourage you to expand your thoughts about what heaven is really going to be like. So here is... Heaven, according to Pastor Keith, all right? Dreaming of heaven. The highlight of heaven is God's presence. He is at the center of paradise in the New Jerusalem. Anytime you like, you can go into God's presence and worship him with perfect voice and heaven's music that is a thousand times better than any music you have ever heard. Your heart is exploding with joy and happiness as you stay there for a million years. You never get tired. You never get distracted. You never get bored. After a million years in God's presence, you decide to go with some of your friends and family to eat at the banquet table in paradise. 
You're attended by angels and eat the most unbelievably delicious food for 15,000 earth years. Um, by the way, I'm just making up these earth years. You're having incredible conversations with this. You're, having in, you're eating now for 1,500 years. You're having incredible conversations and fun with everyone. And you never gain weight. You never feel full. You never get sick. You never need to go to the restroom. And you never need to stop. Then you decide to go back to your mansion and have a family, re family reunion. You ask one of the angels to gather your family and have them come over to your mansion. One eye twinkle later, you're in your mansion, which is on a few hundred acres in paradise. Your relatives begin arriving. The angels have everything perfectly prepared and serve you and your friends for 3,000 years. You eat, play games, have fun. Talk about memories. And no one gets their feelings hurt or says or does anything hurtful. Everyone is mature, sensitive to each other, godly, and very loving and affectionate. There are no ants, gnats, mosquitoes, or no seams. You never get a sunburn, and no one ever gets injured and has to go to the emergency room. You never need money and everything you want is immediately served by the angels. At the end of the family reunion, someone suggests that you all go on an adventure. So you and your group of friends and relatives take a 14,000 year journey or so uh, to explore the new earth. See, you live in the new Jerusalem, so you're gonna go explore the new, there's new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. So you're gonna go on a 14,000 year journey to explore the new earth. There are no animals that are wild anymore, and you can get anywhere you want immediately just by thinking it. The world is a paradise, and there's thrill after thrill after thrill. This new earth is beautiful beyond description. You can travel to the highest mountains without getting fatigued. You can swim underwater for 100 years and never have to come up for air. No need to fear any sea creatures as their fear of man has also been redeemed. There are no deserts or bad places on earth. There's not even a place where any bad thing has ever happened on earth. It's brand new. At the end of your adventure on earth, everyone is thrilled and excited. Someone says they were exploring the universe with a group of friends recently, and they found a galaxy 300 million light years away that was really awesome. So you all agree and go, and at the speed of thought, you're there. For the next 30,000 years, you, uh, you, you and your adventure group explore the galaxy and its stars and its planets. You share great experiences and see things that are beyond description. Everything you see is different from anything you have ever seen before. And it is extremely fun and interesting. After all of this, you decide to go, home, to go back home and visit the Hall of Pavilions. This is a special place, by the way, in heaven. You meet all the heroes of the Bible. All 12 disciples have their own pavilions as well as the Apostle Paul, Mary the mother of Jesus, King David, Daniel, Esther, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and all the other Bible characters. In each pavilion, you personally meet each character and spend time talking and getting to know them. Each of their pavilions have 5D movies of what actually took place in their area of the Bible. In Noah's pavilion, you get to watch him build the ark and ride on the waves of the flood. You see all the animals on the ark and finally understand why Noah didn't just swat those mosquitoes when he had a chance. In Elijah's pavilion, you get to watch as he calls fire down from heaven and to defeat the prophets of Baal. King David's pavilion has interactive games where you can experience the thrill of defeating Goliath just like he did. In Mary's pavilion, you get to witness the birth of Jesus and participate in his childhood events. This, I just put this in because I like sports. I, I don't really know if this will be in that pavilion. 
You'll see him strike out all 18 batters in a little league game while hitting a homer each time at bat. Uh, uh, this just... Uh, he was always the first one chosen on any pickup game, and all of us get to be on his team. But wait, there's more. You also get to participate in his miracles and feel the tingle in your toes as you experience a quick walk on the water. You stay in the Hall of Pavilions for 40,000 years. And after this, you'll have a strong desire to be in God's presence to worship. One microsecond later, all of you are in God's presence. You're worshiping God. He looks at you and smiles. Just then you realize that an angel has you by the hand and is leading you to the Father. Suddenly you find yourself face to face with God for about a hundred years. He personally relates his love to you with wonderful words of affirmation. When you're finished, you return to your place of worship and for seven million more years with a perfect focus that never gets distracted or fatigued, you pour your adoration out on your Father that has redeemed it all for your pleasure. Then some friends ask you to go to the banquet table again. And so on, and so on, and so on. And so it goes in heaven, according to Pastor Keith, as it as eternity rolls on. Oh, P.S., by the way, there are two things that will not be in heaven. First is a COVID-19 mask of any kind. <laughs> Second is hand sanitizer. And think about it, think about it. We are just a twinkle of an eye away from this glorious place. You're going to a place that is indescribable a place of the greatest joy and pleasure that you could possibly imagine. People who don't believe in Jesus are not going to this place. They're going to the most horrible place that anyone could imagine. The Bible calls it the lake of fire, the bottomless pit where the smoke of their torments ascends upward forever and ever and ever. World history is full of examples of people who have rebelled against God. Will you rebel against God? Would this be, would this be you that would rebel against God? I'm just going to say this about myself because I can't speak for any, anybody but me. I'm not going to rebel against God because I've given my life to Him. I've given my life to, to, to serve Him completely and, and totally because when Jesus knocked on the door of my heart, I opened the door and I invited Him in. Look, look, he created me. He bought me back from the devil. He gave me life. And he deserves that I would serve him and worship him and adore him throughout the rest of this life and throughout eternity. And I believe because of that and because of his grace that I'm going to an indescribable land and experience the pleasure of heaven forever and ever and ever. Welcome to Pleasureville. It's quite a place. Look forward to heaven, guys. Not going to be some boring, dull, empty place. It's going to be the place where you are relit into everything God intended you to have all along. And it's just a moment away. All right, bow your head with me. Would you?